Good morning. This is Patricia. I'm here with today's Sunday School lesson. You'll want to have a sheet of paper and pencil handy so that you can write down answers to some of the questions that come up. I'll pause from time to time and give you the opportunity to formulate your answers before I go on. Your father, here we are with the new format, with the new way to study your word. We lift up those affected by the coronavirus. We lift up one another in fellowship and support. And we ask that your presence can be with us even though we're not together. Be with us as we study your word and help us to gain something from it. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, we're ready to begin. The Gospel of John, Jesus is. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus is the humble servant. Last week, we saw that Jesus, the great teacher, is the ultimate voice we must listen to, learn from, and follow. This week, we'll see how Jesus is the ultimate example of servanthood. You'll most likely recognize the story in today's scripture. Yes, the one about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We're going to be reading from John 13, 1 through 17. Where do we see examples of humility? For instance, in our culture. What do we think first? Do we think it's humble that we have trash men that are willing to take away our trash? Do we think of the local handyman as somebody who is humble and willing to do anything that we ask of them. And is this humility, is that in our eyes or is that in theirs? What about the church services center? They are serving humbly, working with people that need our help. Spending time humbly in humility means you're spending time correcting things rather than griping about them. Pick up litter. What? What did I hear you say? I can't go out and pick up litter. People will look at me. They'll see me bend over and talk about how, how fat I am. Um, no, we'll be humble. We will do what needs to be done. Don't write about the litter unless you are willing to go out and pick it up. Well, how about in our church? Are we willing to give up a seat? If somebody sits in our seat, are we willing to be humble enough to let them sit there? Oh my, heaven forbid. Hmm. Are we humble? Do we show humility when we thank people who are leaders in the church? Thanking the musicians. Thanking the pastor. Responding to what pastor says. Are we humble when we accept thanks? Do we brush it off? Or can we, in humility, acknowledge that, yes, we do have gifts, and I'm using them for the Lord. Are we humble when the sermon speaks directly to us, or pastor might admonish us? Are we humble when people approach us 
with ways that we can improve what we're doing. Yes, I heard you. That's not being humble. That's simply being obedient. Well, we must be humble if we're to obey somebody that admits that they are Lord over us. We must admit that God is over us, that Jesus is our Lord, and we obey him. What would be the opposite of humility? Yeah, we know. Arrogance, conceit, feeling superior. The big difference between them is when you're confident, your image of yourself is based on experience, and you can move forward in God's gifts. Arrogance, it's grounded in nothing, and it gives glory to nobody but yourself. So in what ways do we see humility as opposite? prevalent in our culture. What you write down? A desire for praise? Maybe constantly talking about themselves? Maybe they never recognize their mistakes, don't accept criticism. Maybe it's difficult to ask for forgiveness. Maybe they're intolerant of differences and correct others all the time. What this action does is it diminishes the other person in order to empower the self. In our session today, we'll discover that Jesus calls us away from those positions of power that are esteemed by our culture and calls us toward a posture of humility that's expressed in love. Let's view John 13, 1 through 5. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He had always loved those in the world who were his own, and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. Hmm. When reading the Bible, it's always a good practice to ask, why did the writer include that? Or why mention that specific thing at this time? Why do you think John would begin this section by mentioning the upcoming Passover festival what happened at Passover, and how did God act on behalf of his people? Passover commemorates God's deliverance of the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. Our lesson states that God provided deliverance Deliverance that didn't depend on military might. 
John tells us, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. Okay? So John is telling us that Jesus is very intentional about his act of service. Dirty feet. Look at those feet. In the days of Jesus, people wore sandals if they could afford them, and a lot of people went barefoot. But if you look at the feet, the people walked through streets that were not clean, they were not paved. The dung that the animals left was not picked up. There was trash thrown out in the streets. And really, their feet got really bad looking. And our lesson told was really stinky. Now when the Jews would sit to eat, they'd gather around a table, and they'd recline against it, and their feet would be out beside it. Well, you could imagine if their feet were not clean before they ate, what an unappetizing situation that would be. Now, we are told that in this supper, there were no servants. So there was nobody to have washed the disciples' feet before they sat down to eat. They already had begun their meal. And now, Jesus got up to wash their feet. Why do you think he chose to wash the feet of his disciples? Was it simply because he couldn't stand the smell anymore? But the passage tells us Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew he had all power. He knew he was God. He knew what he had, who he was. He also knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew what lay ahead of him. But he loved his disciples. He loved people so much that he wanted to bring them into a right relationship with him. At this table, somebody needed to wash the feet. He took that role of a servant. That is the greatest thing that he could have done to demonstrate his humility and love to his disciples at that point. What does this tell us about the way power is understood in God's kingdom? Jesus knew he was all-powerful. He knew what was going to happen. But knowing who he was, he became a servant. Did you say maybe power in God's kingdom is used to help other people? That might be one way of saying it. What would lead Jesus to assume such a lowly status? Why would he do that? Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to his Father. He loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And this is basically a, a foreshadowing of him being a servant to go to the cross and restoring people and serving them to the end. What does it tell us that Jesus didn't tell his disciples what he was going to do, but instead just silently got up and began washing their feet? What do you think?
Did you say maybe he just didn't want them protesting it? Did you say maybe somebody else would say, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it? What did you say? What is servanthood? It is not about drawing attention to yourself. It is love in action. He just did it. He took the role of the humble servant, leading by example. Let's look at verses 6 through 11. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet. Wash my hands and head too. Those who have taken a bath are completely clean and do not need to wash themselves, except for their feet. All of you are clean. All except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, all of you except one are clean. Well, that kind of puts a different light on being clean. He wasn't cleaning the feet to get simply to get the mud off them, was he? When he talked about being clean, probably they all had a bath. But probably Judas had had a bath too. But he was not clean. Where was he unclean? Was unclean in his inside. Well, we often make fun of Peter for the way he acts without thinking or the way he misunderstands Jesus. But if you were Peter, how would you have reacted? Suppose you invited Pastor and Linda over to your house for dinner and they decided they're going to do your dishes. They're going to uh, walk your dog and pick up after it. Things that you think, no, I didn't invite them for that. But this is something more. Jesus had more of a relationship with them, these disciples and with Peter than we have with our pastor. They lived with him day in, day out. They followed him. They learned from him. Would you have done anything differently than Peter did? Would you have taken him at face value and jumped in and said, do my hands and my head as well? Would you have understood that there was a deeper meaning? What was Jesus saying to Peter and to us? In verses 10 and 11, Jesus says, Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. What was Jesus saying to Peter and to us? What did we say? It's not just the body that he's concerned with. It's never just 
the body. Our lesson says that many people today don't have a part with Jesus because they won't submit to his humble service. What is it Jesus does for us? What is it that he does for us that we think he doesn't need to do? Did you look back at the cross and look at what he did for us there in all humility, giving up all the power, all the glory that was his for us? If some of us will not claim that for ourselves, and if we don't accept that, we don't have a part of him. We are not included in his body in his disciples, in his family. Why is it so difficult for many people in our society, even for some of those in the church, to submit to humble service to other people? Well, we might get dirty. Well, I got my own stuff to do. Well, somebody else should do that. Well, they could hire it done. Well, I'm the one who does this or that. I don't do that. I mean, you know, you take me. Kitchen work? Oh my goodness. That is humbling to me. I don't like to do it. But you know what? If there's a need for it, I will. I will. What is it that you don't like to do that you put back because you have other things that you do better or you like to do? What is it that you avoid? You have to humble yourself to do that. Is it visitation? Is it talking to people on the phone who need encouragement? What is it? Have you ever received humble service from somebody else? If you did, what did you learn from that experience? Take a minute and think about that. Maybe you said it was sometime when you were sick, say with the flu. We can make a bit of a mess then, don't we? But a lot of times we have someone who will come in and they'll clean up after us. They'll take care of the mess that we make. I had an experience one time where I was hurt. I wasn't able to walk. Yet a friend came and took me to the emergency room, took me to get a hotel room because I was out of town, and checked on me the next day to make sure I was going to be okay, and even offered to drive me back home if I was unable to drive. To me, that was a humble servant. They didn't have to do that. What does being treated by somebody in a way that they don't really have to do that for you. We love them. We appreciate them, don't we? So being a servant, helping other people, helps create a bond. It gives us a way to relate to them that opens the door that we can share the good news of Christ. Well, let's look at verses 12 to 17. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on, and 
and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've just done to you? You call me teacher and lord. And it is right that you should do so because that is what I am. I, your lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you. So that you will do just what I've done for you. I am telling you the truth. No slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. Okay. So being like Christ isn't just simply an attitude. It's following Jesus, doing what he has done. Oh, wait, is that something we've been hearing in our Sunday school lessons the past several weeks? Is it called obedience? God didn't call you just to say, hi God, I love you, but to show your love in action, to obey him. How do you see this playing out in our passage? Jesus didn't tell them what to do, did he? He demonstrated the love and the humility. He demonstrated that in not only this act, but in everything he did, that he was a servant. This is who Jesus was. This is who he calls us to be. Do you think it's enough just to have that interior, purely spiritual experience with Jesus? Maybe you do. Maybe you think you're to the point that there's nothing you can do physically to obey Jesus. That it's all just inside, reading your Bible, feeling it, knowing it. Maybe you do. But Christ-likeness means obeying God, obeying His Word, and modeling the life of Christ in all we say and do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ-likeness means obeying God's Word and modeling the life of Christ in all we say and do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why are Christ-like actions necessary in following Jesus? What is the whole Bible about? Why were the Israelites punished? They did not obey. It's about obedience. If you love, you obey. Jesus showed us how to act. We can emulate him. He won people. We can bring people to Christ through our being like him. Or put it the other way, if you do not act like Christ, you're definitely going to push people away. If you call yourself a Christian and you don't act as a Christian, you do a disservice to God, to the church, and to the other people. You're pushing them away. We need to be Christ-like, to draw them, to help them into the kingdom. What do you think Jesus meant by saying that no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him? Okay. Did you say that because Jesus washed their feet, 
the disciples could wash other people's feet as well. If Jesus set the example of being a servant and he's our master, shouldn't we do the same? If he's living a life as a servant, we can do no less than also living the servant life. We see in the story that Jesus humiliated himself before the disciples and he defined what love looks like. Well, think of someone you consider most like Jesus. Does someone come to mind right away? Maybe two or three? Or is it hard to think of anybody? Okay, you've got somebody in mind. What makes the person that way? Why do you think they're like Jesus? How do they model the life of Jesus? One of the people that I like to share about was my Sunday school teacher when I was a young adult who didn't cuss, oh my goodness. She didn't get angry, oh my goodness. She worked in the Baptist bookstore and one day I was in there shopping and a man came in to pick up curriculum. I hope it was not a pastor. But he came in to pick up curriculum for his church, and they were out of it. She said, I'm sorry, we're out of it. We'll get some more in in a couple of days. And this man cussed her and lit into her. And she didn't respond in kind. And she simply said, I'm so sorry. We will get them in. I will call you. This showed me how I was not. She was kind and loving as Jesus was. I knew how I would have acted in her place, which was not kind and loving like Jesus. Today, your thoughts and actions are defining Christ-likeness for those in your sphere of influence. When people look at you and know that you're a Christian, what you do tells them what Christ is like. So think about this. Based on the way you live, how would others define Christ-likeness? How does it match up with what we see here in the actions of Jesus? Jesus embodied the characteristics of the suffering servant the humble son, and the messianic king. The account of him washing the disciples' feet illustrate his identity in all of these respects. What does it mean for you to be a foot washer in your world?
Let's close today with a prayer from John Wesley. O Lamb of God, who, by both your example and precept, instructed us to be meek and humble, give me grace throughout my whole life, in every thought and word and work, to imitate your meekness and humility. Mortify in me the whole body of pride. Grant me to feel that I am nothing and have nothing, and that I deserve nothing but shame and contempt, but misery and punishment. Grant, O Lord, that I may look for nothing, claim nothing, and that I may go through all the scenes of life, not seeking my own glory, but looking wholly unto you and acting wholly for you. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.